let's go forward here. So thank you, Robert. Okay, there's Belo Horizonte. And then this is the, uh, what's called the Crucero, Crucero, 100 Crucero. It's like $20 bill in America. Well, I'm gonna switch that. It's like a $100 bill now in America. Okay, did you understand what I just did? <laughs> I guess, but anyway. But uh, anyway, what happened is they had this little machine and they had stuffed it full of these $20 bills from Brazil and they were showing the farmer. It just kept spitting them out. And the farmer's like, oh my goodness. He said, that's amazing. And so they said, say, have you done well in your life, like financially over the years, you know? Have you done well? He said, yeah. He said, pretty well. He said, you know, I've, I've saved up about $45,000 in my life. And they said, you're kidding. That's exactly the price for this machine. And he says, just think what it would be like to have a limitless flow. Whenever you needed this thing, would just keep printing out this money. And so, you know, they have the thing going there, and it's still spitting out the money. And he just gets overwhelmed, and he's mesmerized. And, of course, you know, apparently, you know, I don't know what Belo Horizonte is like, but you know what? He, he uh, you know, was just a common person, and he didn't really think twice. He was mesmerized by these men and what they're, how they're talking to him and everything. And so, nonetheless, he gave the four men his life savings, and uh, he was printing out, after they left, he was printing out all of this money over and over and over. But eventually, you know what happened. Eventually, <laughs> there was only so many uh, cru cruceros in that machine, and eventually, it quit spitting them out. And then all of a sudden, he said, uh-oh. He said, what happened? And he went to the police, and they said, hey, you know what? He said, this was a scam. He said, it's a fake. And then he was begging the police. Uh, one of the last things he said to the police was, make it work, make it work. And he was begging them to make it work. Well, it isn't going to work because it had X number of bills inside. And that's what happened. Well, you know what? Let's fast forward 50 years uh, since that time. And now we're living in a world of ransomware and phishing and email scams. And, you know, it doesn't seem like a day goes by where you're not reading in the paper or hearing about somebody that, you know, lost their life savings. You know, years ago, believe it or not, this uh, lady in our church called me and she said, Pastor Bob, could the church use $100,000? And I'm like, you know, the minute she said that, I'm like... Uh, yes, why? <laughs> because I'm like, I'm waiting for the punchline. But anyway, but sure enough, there was a punchline. And she said, oh, she said, great. She said, because I'm going to, I'm going to come into a lot of money. I'm going to have a million dollars, and I want to tithe 10% on that million dollars. And I said, oh, I think God raised that to like 30%. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. But anyway, uh, I said, uh, so how, how is that? How are you going to come? I said, did somebody pass away? She said, no. She said, this wonderful man in Ethiopia, he was sending me flowers and chocolates, and, and uh, he's just been so kind to me. And he said, listen, if you'll just send me $5,000, I'm going to send you in about another week. I'm going to send you a million dollars. And she did. And she, and I told her immediately, I said, and I said her name, and I said, you know what, you're not going to get that money. And I talked to her about how these people were scamming people forever, <laughs> and she just couldn't believe it. You know, the sad thing was, everybody, after, you know, we convinced her that she got scammed, not long after that, she did it again. She did it again. Yeah. And so anyway... All that to say is, uh, these people, when they hear this news, they're initially, they're full of joy, they're full of happiness, they can't get, things couldn't be any better, and then, you know, they go from this incredible high to this horrible low. And you know, and as we've been walking through the book of Galatians since the beginning of this year, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, what we've seen is that this kind of deception <laughs> Have you heard about this fake, fake news and everything? Okay, fake, fact, fake. Okay, um, this kind of deception 
It doesn't happen to people just financially, okay? It doesn't happen to people just technologically, you know, like for instance, a hospital gets hit with ransomware and they say, if you don't send us $5 million, you're gonna lose all your data. You'll never access it again. And this is, that's just uh, off the charts bad for hospitals and doctors and things like that. But this doesn't happen just financially, it doesn't happen just technologically, it happens spiritually as we've seen in the book of Galatians. And guess what, we're, we're just as, as prone, we're just as susceptible, everyone, if we're not careful, of getting duped by people that don't have our best interests in mind. And of course I'm speaking of, spiritually speaking, a spiritual deception. And so this morning what I've done is I've entitled my message like this, so much to lose. Because in this passage, Paul gives uh, several ways that Christians are rooked, <laughs> are duped, are taken advantage of by false teachers and false teaching. And we've got to, like I said last week, we need to be on our guard because, you know, one day... Uh, you know, the people that we're all passing the baton to that are going to come after us, that are going to be uh, heading up Ridgepoint and preaching and everything like that down the road, uh, they're going to need to be strong and we're going to need to be strong for them and so on and so forth because a lot of times, you know, churches don't go very long before they just go down the tubes. They just become, a like Jesus talked about, a, a nest full of uh, birds evil birds. And so I want us to pray and then we're going to get right into this. I'm going to tell you another story right away and we'll get into the text of God's word. But let's bow for prayer everyone. Pray that God will use this topic so much to lose. Father, this is what we don't want, Lord. We don't want anybody in any way being, uh, being taken advantage of, being rooked, Lord, we just uh, ask that your word would be powerful in our lives today, this section, Lord, where we're getting into the day-by-day nitty-gritty of the Christian life, Lord. We've done the, the biographical part. We've done the historical part. But now, Lord, we're in to this part of Galatians where it's hitting uh, us in a day-to-day -day way, in a practical, experiential way, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray you'll put your hand on your people and that their minds would be tuned in to what you, Lord, are saying through your word. And we pray these things in your precious name, Jesus, and for your sake. Amen. <clears throat> now, these next couple of slides are going to be really crummy because that's how our TVs were this long ago. But back in the early 90s, one of the worst losses in pro football history had to belong to the old Houston Oilers. I forgot about this slide. This is a pretty good slide. That's an actual ticket to 1993. It's uh, the Houston Oilers, they were called back then. And they're in the third quarter of their playoff game, okay? The wild card playoff game. Houston Oilers in the third quarter. Houston Oilers, 35, and the Buffalo Bills, 3. 35 to 3, a 32 point lead in a playoff game. Like, this is a massive amount. In two quarters almost isn't enough to come back. But guess what? Houston couldn't do anything those final two quarters. They couldn't score if their life depended on it. And the Bills just started scoring and scoring, and scoring, and scoring, and it got down to the very end of, of regulation, and the game ended up, uh, uh, that's the early, with 13, 19 left, you know, it's 15 minutes per quarter, so there was like a half an hour left. That was the score, but then, oh, I went, I went too fast. <laughs> what happened is, in, in regulation time, they tied 38 to 38. Okay, so the buff Buffalo in the final two quarters scored 35 points, and the Oilers only scored three, but they were tied. But you know the end of the story. Yep, Houston blew it. They didn't win this game. They were winning by 32 points. This was the final score. The Buffalo Bills 41, the Oilers 38. They won with a field goal in overtime. It was 
pandemonium on the Buffalo Bills sideline. But that was a collapse of epic proportions for the Oilers. And as we've seen in our series here on Galatians, loss doesn't occur on the football field either, uh, only. It doesn't occur on the football field only. We've seen loss occurring for these Christians living in this little area of Galatia. They paid a huge price. You know why? They stopped listening to what God's man had told them, the Apostle Paul. He was giving them God's word right from the mind of God. God was giving him direct revelation and telling, this is what you tell my people. But they weren't listening to him. But they were listening to these false teachers that came into their little tiny house churches they had back in those days. These, these false teachers were coming in and like, you know, like that guy, that farmer in Belo Horizonte, I mean, they just, uh, they just got ravaged by these false teachers. They were just mesmerized. And man, it was like money coming out of machine. Well, if you get to verse 4 in this text that we're in, here's what Paul says to God's people. That's a misspelling on my part. It should be Galatians 5, 4. You, you Galatian Christians have fallen from grace. Now, I've heard the illustration used, and it's a good one. You can't fall off a ladder that you're not ever on. <laughs> you know, several years ago, I fell off a ladder. Dummy me, I'm in the backyard, and, you know, I've got the, the, uh, uh, pole trimmer. I've got this, you know, big long trimmer that has a, 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 a machine on the end, a device that's chopping off all the branches. Well, what was happening was one of the legs of the ladder was in some kind of mushy part of the ground. So four legs on a ladder is great. Three legs is no bueno, okay? And then all of a sudden, I, I'm starting to tilt and then, so I toss the, you know, the, it's a pole saw with a chainsaw on the end. I couldn't think of chainsaw. And I throw that thing, and now I'm going down for the count. I'm falling off the top of the ladder, and I'm, Foop! and I land on my shoulder. And I'm like, oh, 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 that's going to be bad. And it was, because like it took like several years for that to go away. And like I'd be up here some Sundays, and I've got tears rolling down my eyes nearly. I'm holding my arm up like this during music practice and then during church. And man, it was so painful. But my wonderful wife, she read on the internet and she said, Bob, they said if you'll get on a, on a bar and you'll just hang as long as you can every day, it'll take that pain away. And sure enough, I'm like, glory to God in the highest. I mean, like, and I still do it. I still get on every day and I, and I hang because I don't want that pain coming back because I had it for like three years. So anyway, so you can't fall off a ladder that you're not on. They have fallen from grace. Did they know grace? Did they have grace? Yeah, they were on that ladder, but they fell. And when you fall, it's no good. It's bad. They fell from a grace-oriented way of thinking and living. Okay, like as Christians, hey, we are to be gracious. We are, sit down, sit down. No, I'm just kidding. I need to be gracious. <laughs> oh, oh. She wasn't gracious back. She stuck her tongue out at me. Okay. So anyway, hey, by the way, the church I got saved in, you did not leave. And if you did, you got your ears rattled when, when Bob and Dolores Ernst were like in their 20s, they were having their first child, and my same preacher that ended up moving up to Chicago that I had when he was an older preacher, he was young, and they said, Bob, that happened to us back in like 1954. We were in his church, and this is the first day we were visiting there, and, and, uh, and um, my wife was expecting our first child. And, and, and Dolores, she got sick and she had to leave. And I said, okay, okay, let's go. If you got to go, if you're going to get sick. And so they stood up right in the middle of the sermon and they started to walk out and the pastor, hey, get back in your seat. And Bob said, keep walking, keep walking. And they walked out and he said, we never returned. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's no bueno, but yeah, like, that, that was the way it was with him, man. You just didn't do that. So anyway, um, they, the Galatians lost this graciousness. They lost this gracious way of living. They lost this gracious way of thinking. 
I'm thinking like a New Covenant person, a New Testament person. And they start thinking like the Old Testament. And you know what, man? That's falling off the spiritual ladder. That is going from joy and grace to like, oh man, I've got to keep these laws and I've got to do these things. And if I don't, these people say that I may not make it into heaven and that kind of thing. And man, that's drudgery. That's no, no good. It's miserable. And so in our text today, here in Galatians 5, Christians who fall from grace into legalism, this Old Testament way of living, okay, like the Jews did in the Old Testament, they lose three precious things. And we're going to look at those this morning. We're going to read the Word of God. First of all, I want you to notice here in the first couple of verses, what do God's people lose? They don't lose their salvation. They lose their freedom. They lose their freedom. You know, when I first got saved, oh my goodness, I was just so, I was on cloud nine for so many months. It was so great to know God, to be saved, to tell my friends about Jesus. There's nothing like that freedom where God sets you free. For almost 19 years, I was living in the jail of uh, ritualistic religion. You couldn't know you were saved. The church I was in, they said, you can't know that you're saved. You can't ever have assurance because they think if you get assurance, you're going to live like the devil. No, you know what you live like? If you realize that God has saved you and you'll never uh, be condemned, you'll never be judged, you live like a free person. You're free and you're like, yes, and it brings you joy and you want to. See, Christianity, New Testament Christianity is the inside out. It's not like, well, I guess I have to do this. What a way to live. What a boring way. You get to, man. I get to do this. You know, I don't sit here. I've been playing the guitar, you know, since I was 12 years old. And I've been playing here at the church since 1992. And you know what? Every Sunday, you know, I don't sit here like, man, I've got to play the guitar. You know what? I'm like, hallelujah, I get to play. This is awesome, you know. And so if you, if you live life that way, life is going to be so much better than to be like, oh, man, I've got to go to church. I've got to give. I've got. Hey, listen, you know what? When you give, you're laying up treasure in heaven that is going to last you forever. Yeah. And when, you get, and when you serve and all those things, if you, just, if you just let God set you free and change your mindset, you won't believe how much better life is. When, when life uh, sends you, you know, when life clobbers you, you know, you don't, oh, no, what are we going to do? Oh, this is horrible. The air conditioners aren't working. And it's so much money. What are we going to That's the worst way to live. It's better to do what God says and say, Lord, hallelujah, I count it all joy. You knew this is coming, and you're on the throne. I don't have anything. You're so great. You're so, you know, hey, have you had a roof over your head like Jamie said earlier? Have you had food in your stomach three, eight, nine, 12, 14 times a day? Me, 27 times. But anyway, yes, yeah. And so we have so much to glorify God and be thankful for, but we don't need to be walking around just like, oh man, life is so rough and horrible. And no. Look at what it says in verses one and two here. Paul says, stand fast, therefore. Remember last Sunday? We put this verse right at the end because this begins a new chapter in our Bible, but Paul's still talking about what he just talked about in chapter four about Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac and Sarah and Abraham. And he says, look, don't be a slave. Don't be like Hagar and her child. Be free, like Sarah. Be free. Jesus made you free the day you got saved. Live like it. You were in jail spiritually. He set you out of jail. Live like it. Yeah, that's right. Stand fast. Stand firm in the liberty, the freedom by which Christ has made us free. And do not, do not, do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. You know what a yoke is. If you have two cattle back in Bible days, they had this monstrosity of a device where they would stick the cow's heads through and they'd put two cows 
and they'd stick their heads through the holes and then they'd clamp that down and connected to that big yoke was all of the things coming back to the plow and they'd whip those cows and the cows would start moving and pull and drag that and think about it on their neck and of course they got a lot of leather there so that's pretty cool for a cow but if it was a human but he's saying hey you don't want to be wearing a yoke of bondage in other words the law of Moses you put yourself under the law you're obligated to keep the whole thing you don't get just one thing you got to do. The false teachers come in and, you know, they use that as the hook. Hey, listen, if you'll, <clears throat> if you'll just get circumcised, that's all you got to do. You know, and like, I'd be like, uh, no, <laughs> I'm not doing that. I don't care what you say. Get out of my church. Okay, so, but, but they did. They got all worked up. Okay, don't be entangled again with this yoke of bondage. Indeed, truly, I, Paul, say to you, that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. In other words, you're going to put yourself under the Old Testament law, then Jesus is not going to do you a whit of good. Because now you're going to be a law keeper instead of being a free person in Christ and in glorifying God, bringing him glory, loving it and enjoying it. Christ made him free. Notice but they wanted the yoke of bondage. They didn't realize it. It's like the farmer we talked about. They didn't realize what they were getting themselves into. And Paul said, hey, do you want to be like the cow dragging the plow? No, man, I don't want that. Well, that's where you're at. And of course, notice, I think, let's see, if you become circumcised. So some of the people, Paul says in verse 4, you've fallen from grace. Some of them had already fallen. Some of them were already listening to the teacher. Some of them were about to. If you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing, okay? Um, legalism, living under the Old Testament law. A bunch of the adult men in Galatia were about to undergo circumcision. They, were, they weren't Jews. They weren't circumcised on the eighth day after they were born. They were uncircumcised. They were Gentiles, which, you know, 99% of them, unless people became eunuchs or some other thing like that, none of them were. And they were about to. But when that happens, uh, Paul says it here. Let me see. I've got to put it up here. If you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Why? Because under legalism, like I said earlier, where's a person's focus? Where's the Christian's focus? It's on, okay, I've got to do this, and I've got to do this, and oh, man, if I don't do this, and they told me i got to be here, and they told me this, da -da 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 and they've got all these things going on, and, and again, <clears throat> I know sometimes we sound up here like God doesn't have any rules or commandments or things for us, and that's not true because we're not under the law of Moses, we're under the law of Christ. But the law of Christ is awesome. <laughs> he says, you can boil it all down to one thing, love your neighbor as yourself. Greatest command, love God with all your heart. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. And basically God says, if you love me, and if you love your neighbor, you're fulfilling the entire law. The whole law, you know, for all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Man, how much easier is that than having 613 laws? Okay, which ones am I missing up? Which ones am I, you know, and you're getting all tied up in knots. And God just says, listen, be a person of love. Be a person of joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. <laughs> there is nothing hindering you from doing those things and that saying, nope, don't do that. Against such, there is no law. God just says, be like Jesus. And if you start focusing on the law, Christ isn't going to do you any good because you know why? And by the way, I fell into this very trap myself. A few months after I was a new Christian, a professor got up in the Bible colleges I was at, and he said, I'm going to teach today on how you can test whether or not you're saved. And listen, I went from cloud nine. I had been there since the day I got saved, and in one hour, boom, I was on the bottom because suddenly, guess what? My focus went to how awesome it was to be saved by Jesus and in that hour, I started twirling these things around in my mind. Wow, do I really love people? 
Do I really love God? Am I really keeping his commandments? Well, look, man, I'm artistic. I'm touchy-feely, okay? Like, I'm a highly emotional person. And so I'm sitting there, and like I'm, my answers to all the questions, are you doing this? Are you doing this? Are you doing this? I'm like, no, no, and no. <laughs> and you know what? It was the worst, worst, worst time in my life. I, I, had gone, I had gone down so badly after that happened that eventually I took my tape recorder that I got as a paper boy when I was 12. I thought that was the greatest thing. But anyway, I took that tape recorder, I put a cassette in it, and I recorded a suicide note to my mom and dad. Because no matter what I did, no matter who I went to, nobody could tell me how I could have assurance of my salvation. I went to my pastor. I went to professors. And they're all like, well, man, it's easy. Just walk down the aisle again, pray the sinner's prayer, and get baptized, and you'll have your assurance back. All right. So I did it. I did that. Guess what? I didn't get my assurance back because assurance isn't in that. That's not, that's not how you get assurance. So no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't do it. I'd go to the bookstore, and of course, I'd buy books that are this thick, and they were books by, uh, by Reformed theologians. <laughs> that say you have to keep the law of Moses and you have to and and so I'm reading these big thick books from from the ancients from the puritans 300 years ago and it's just awful and so finally I just said hey I I've got I'm going to check out and thankfully my dear wife or she was my fiance she saves the belt she saves me from certain death again I think Kelly saved me about 100 times from killing myself <laughs> specifically of how I drive but like <laughs> Okay. I saw that. I was just testing you. <laughs> Not really. But anyway, oh man. But you know what, everybody? It was the worst period of my life, and and uh, I'm so thankful that God brought me out of that nosedive because it's awful. It's awful. And so, the question under point number one is this: Do you want to be do you want to be friends with the legalists or do you want to be friends with the Lord? Okay? That's what Paul was getting across to the Galatians. Do you really want to be friends with the legalists, those people of the law, or do you want to be people of the Lord? Do you want to get up in the morning and say, Lord, thank you for giving me a new day. Thank you, Lord. I'm your child. My name's written down in the book of life. I'm going to see you one day. Maybe it'll be today. Maybe you'll return today. Lord, I'm so thankful to be your child. I'm so thankful to have your spirit dwell. You get the idea? Or do you want to get a... Oh, man. I'm, a, I'm awake again. Man. Another day gotta get up. And, you know what I'm saying. That's no way to live, everybody. And again, I realize, man, listen, I'm like, I'm kind of like on uh, like 50 cups of coffee. I'm like, I don't, I don't drink coffee, but I feel like I'm drank 50 cups of coffee. I'm like George Carlin. Hey, you got the guy at the work that's always pulling out the coffee pot. Hey, how you doing? Good. I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing? How you doing? You know, and he was giving that, that comedy about the guy that drank too much coffee at work. But anyway, but you know, spiritually, I think it's a good thing to be more people of joy than to just be focusing on all the negatives in life and all the things that are, is happening around us. So first, Christians who fall from grace to legalism, they lose the joy that attends their wonderful freedom in Christ. The second way that they, they suffer loss is this, everybody. They not only lose their freedom in Christ, they lose their fellowship with Christ. You know, Jesus said, abide in me. He didn't say abide in the law of Moses. He said, abide in me. Stay close. Abide means have fellowship. Stay close. Stay close to me. You know, it's like I'm saying, wake up and say, Lord, it's so great to walk with you in the cool of the morning. It's so awesome to be with my God, my Savior. You know what I mean? Think like a person should think that's been let out of prison. Think like a person who's free and not sitting there. Oh. <laughs> you get the idea. 
Galatians 5, 3 and 4. Paul says, and I testify. It's kind of like he's putting his hand on the Bible. I'm going to give a sworn oath here. I'm going to testify. I'm going to give a witness. I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor. Guess what? You, go, you become a legalist, you're going in debt. Okay, let's raise our hands. How many of you want to go into deeper debt? <laughs> okay, no one. Okay, they're going into debt spiritually. You're a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become, notice this, estranged from Christ. It, he didn't say, you've lost the possession of Christ. You've been booted by Christ. You've been, no. He said, you know what? It's like when people aren't getting along. Like a person will say, well, I've been estranged from my parents for 20 years. What does that mean? It means that you haven't really talked to them. You haven't fellowship with them. You haven't had joy. You haven't had the Christmas dinners and the Easter dinners and the Thanksgiving dinners and the cool things and, and all the joy and happiness when a family comes together. You've been estranged. You who attempt to be justified by law. Trying to go to heaven based on what you do. Oh boy, isn't that great? Hallelujah. Guess what? I did three things right today. I did 33 things wrong, but I did three things right. I'm so happy I'm going to be justified by law. No, you have fallen from grace. He said, estranged means loss of your closeness to Jesus. You don't lose salvation because salvation is eternal. Whoever believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. So you, you're going to have God's life, and you're going to have his spirit dwelling in you forever. Okay? And you're going to have, have uh, Jesus as your Savior and God as your Father forever and ever. But what you lose is just like you have an earthly father. He's still your father, but you may not have talked to him in 25 years. That's being estranged. Okay? The Galatians thought that all the false teachers wanted for them was to undergo circumcision. And Paul says, nope, the law is all or nothing. Once a Christian mixes grace and law, he's under obligation to obey the entire law. Okay? The entire law. He's a debtor to keep the whole law. That's a terrible debt to be under. 613 commandments. And guess what? The Bible says if you, if you don't keep them all, you're under the curse. So the minute you blow one of the one commandment out of the 613, you're toast. <laughs> if you're trying to be justified that way, you've already, you've already uh, lost that opportunity. It's not going to happen. Of course, the Lord Jesus, you know, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Lord, I've kept all those commandments from my youth up. And of course, what did Jesus say to him? Do, do this and you'll live. He said, do this and you'll have eternal life. What was Jesus doing with that guy? He's showing him, uh, you've not kept the commandments. And of course, he convicted him because he was greedy. He wasn't, gra wasn't gracious. He wasn't, uh, uh, he wasn't generous. He's greedy because Jesus told him to sell everything he has and give it to the poor. And he says, oh, what? And then see, he's trying to convict him of his sin, that he didn't keep all those things. Because the Bible says, even Paul says, he reiterates Jesus in Romans 2, you know, that whoever by patience and well-doing in doing good has eternal life. Yeah, if you could do that perfectly and for your entire life, God would bestow on you eternal life. But there's not one person that ha ever has or ever will be able to do it. So salvation's got to be a gift. It's got to be by grace. Okay, you have a choice. Earn it or accept it as a gift. <laughs> and if you earn it, you can't earn it because you've already messed up. Okay, because God... God's standard for earning it is perfection. You, have, you can't have any sins ever. Okay? Let me give you an illustration of this. Okay. Okay, say this guy is signing up because he wants to become a citizen of the United States. And they've got all kinds of paperwork you've got to do. There's all kinds of hoops that you have to jump through. And so you've got to do all these laws. You've got to keep all of these laws and commandments and, and, uh, and different uh, rules to be naturalized. 
Eventually, let's say the guy becomes a citizen of the United States. Let's say he's a bona fide citizen of the United States. And can that person then say something like this? Can he say something like this? Well, I followed the laws to become a citizen, but I don't feel obligated to keep the rest of the laws of the United States. Can they say that? Well, they can, but you know what? They're not going to be a free citizen very long. Because you know what? Yeah, there was, you know, when, he, when you began to keep the laws of the USA, you're not obligated just to keep the naturalization laws. You're obligated to keep the laws, you know, of everything else the, the government demands. Okay? You know, I worked for a guy one time that decided he didn't have to pay taxes. And uh, that was a real uh, crazy time when I went to, to court for him and gave him the best, uh, what do you call it, a, uh, you know, where you go and you give a testimony about their character. Man, I hope I didn't lie. <laughs> you know, you're trying to say, okay, the guy hasn't paid his taxes in eight years, but, you know, he's a great guy. And, you know, in a sense he was, but he wasn't a great guy in that matter. But anyway, uh, just like this guy that's trying to become a citizen, he's obligated to keep all the laws, not just the initial ones. I want us to focus real quickly on four things, and I'm not going to spend very much time, and we're going to go rapid fire here like a machine gun, but these are some of the heavy consequences. Paul gives several here, okay? What happens from falling from grace into legalism, into this kind of just mindset of, oh, oh me, all my problems, all these things to do, that kind of spirit and kind of Christian life, okay? First of all, you go from a rich experience of God's grace, a rich daily experience, to being a debtor to keep the whole law of Moses. Okay, we just read that. You're a debtor to keep the whole law. Second, you go from resting, resting in Christ's finished work to seeking to be justified by rules. Okay, instead of just enjoying life and saying, Lord, Thank you for your promises. You promised that if I believed in you, you would give me eternal life, and you've done that, and my name's written in the book of life. And instead of having that, that rest, just so like, this is so awesome. Now you're focused on, okay, am I doing well enough? Is what I'm doing adequate? Am I loving my neighbor enough? That's no way to live. That's no way to live. Now, we should be, I mean, on a human level, we should be concerned that we're loving and we're being like Christ to some degree. I mean, we can't, we can't always know, you know, how well we're doing or how well we're not doing, but the important thing is your focus, is, is the spirit, okay, the desire, that inward desire that God and his spirit inside of you motivates you to 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 glorify God. So what do we have here? Verse 4, uh, you have been estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. What's another one here? Uh, you go from living a grace-oriented life to a law-oriented life. You've fallen from grace. You're not, you're not living in that, uh, you're not living in that uh, uh, environment anymore. Okay? You're not there. Now it's law, law, law. What do I got to do? What do I got to do? What do I got to do? And, and again, I realize that God has things for us to do in the New Testament, but it's from the inside out. It's with joy. And it's not, you know what? You need to put out of your mind like, oh, I've got to do this. You know, that's no way to live. You'll just be so, you'll just be so um, sad and, and beat down. Man, think of it like, man, I get to do this. Glory to God. Okay, so finally here, number four, and then we'll, we'll finish with point three. You go from an exciting focus on your future glorification. Okay, guess what, everybody? Question, one day are you and I all going to see Jesus? Yeah, we will be like him because we'll see him as we, he is. That's what it means to be glorified. These old bodies... They're getting booted, and we're getting our eternal glorified bodies that are going to be perfect, perfect, 
Never sin again. Never think anything bad. Never say anything bad. Never want to do anything bad. Oh, it's going to be so great, and we're looking forward to that day. We will be really, really free. I mean, we're free now because God has set us free, but then we'll be ultimately free. We'll be completely free. And how great that's going to be. But you know what? They couldn't focus on that. The Galatians, Paul said, you know, you used to focus on that, but you can't anymore because you know where your focus has gone? Your focus has gone from seeing Jesus, that today may be the day you see Jesus, your focus has gone to, man, look at all this. And, and you know what? I know we have to deal with problems, but it, the way you face them makes all the difference in the world. If you'd face it with faith, and in fact, I want to read this here because there's a little tweak we're going to do in verse 5. Verse 4, Galatians, you've fallen from Christ. But, verse 5, we, we, by faith, I'm tweaking let me see something. Let me go back one. Okay. Paul says, We, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now, the way that's worded in the New King James is not the best because they put by faith at the end. Righteousness by faith. Well, we start thinking of salvation. We think about God giving us his righteousness when we put our faith in Christ. Now, look at the way we've tweaked this. For we, and we moved it from the end, we, by faith, we Christians, by our faith in God, not for salvation, our faith in God for day-to-day -day life. For we, by faith, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness, which is our glorified bodies. Our hope, everyone, is the day when our righteousness will be perfect. And you know what? If that's not, when, when you're going through your day-to-day -day life and you haven't thought about that in three months, that's, no, that's not good. Because you know what? It could happen today. The moment we see Jesus, the moment the rapture takes place, boom, we suddenly are perfect and we're standing in the presence of Jesus. Our justification, getting saved, happens instantly in a moment. Our glorification being like Jesus in our bodies, our perfection happens in a moment. Our sanctification in the middle between those two points is lifelong. We're always going to be growing, 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 Lord willing, in the likeness of Jesus. Okay, so by moving by faith from here to up here in Greek, uh, from the Greek, we, by faith, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. It makes it easier to understand what they're hoping for and what we're hoping for, okay? So, Paul was not deceived into focusing on the law. And that's why he said, we, for we. He's using the editorial we. He said, verse 4, you, Galatians, you all, but we, that's the editorial we, me, I, you know, he's talking about himself, but I, through faith, uh, through, I say, by faith, through the Spirit, eagerly wait. I, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't fallen from grace, Paul says. I'm not law-oriented like you are, Galatians. And I'm waiting. I don't know what you're waiting for. I'm thinking you're, you're, you're waiting to be justified by the law. I'm waiting to be glorified by the King. Okay? Just have a little bit to go here. When you drive... Do you drive? Now, nah, thank God I don't do this because Kelly would warn me about doing this. But I don't drive by, by looking in the rear view mirror. <laughs> you know what? You would be in bad shape because you have to drive with your eyes on the road. They tell you that. But you know what? If you're looking in the rear view mirror, you need the rear view mirror. Okay, you look up there. Okay, that's good. Okay. That's the difference between living a legalistic life and a life of grace. Our focus, Jesus, the return of Christ, the kingdom of God, laying up our treasure in heaven, getting ready for that future day. You're looking in front of you, not in the rearview mirror. Oh, man, have I done well enough? Last week was a total disaster. I'm probably not saved. You get the idea. Looking back trying to figure out whether you're saved because you do this or you don't do that and all that. That's, that's a losing, losing battle. Verse 6 tells us where the truly rewarding Christian life is centered. 
for in Christ Jesus. Are we in Christ Jesus, everybody? Yeah, we're in Christ. The day you get saved, you are in Christ. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision profits anything but faith working through love. Okay? Remember 1 Corinthians? Three greatest things, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So by faith means your faith in Jesus and God uses you to love. You put your faith and focus on Jesus for your day-to-day -day life. Lord, you're going to help me today. Lord, you're going to get me through this day. You're going to let me rise up with wings of eagles. I'll run and not be weary. I'll walk and not faint. Lord, I'm putting my faith and focus on you. Then he says, that opens the door for you to love others. You're looking. You're not sitting there focusing on me, myself, and I. You're focusing, hey, how can I be a blessing to them? How can I do, you know, and you're trying to help others, okay? Let's get to the final point. What have we seen so far in the Galatians fall from grace into legalism? First, they lost their freedom. They became like slaves. Second, they lost their fellowship with Jesus. They became focused on rules. And third, and this is wrapping it up, they lost their fervor. They lost their fervor for Jesus. You know what? Like fervor, zeal, being on fire. You ran well, verse 7. You ran well. That's, that's past tense. You ran well, okay? That you were, back in, in, there was a time months ago when I first brought you to me, you were doing great. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? That's why, by the way, last week I forgot to say something. <laughs> Sorry. Remember I put up the, the bio, biograph, biography channel and then I put up the history channel and then I put up ESN, ESP, uh, ESPN. Do you know what? I forgot to say something about ESPN, but the reason that we put that up there is because Paul's concerned about their running. How are they running? ESPN is sports. Life, the Christian life is a marathon. It's a marathon. And Paul's saying, guess what? You were going great and now it's like somebody put uh, put weights on your ankles and you're like Ugh! trying to run and he said it's awful he said who hindered you and of course he knew who hindered them he's trying to make them answer the question Paul answers his own question here if you look at verse 8 Paul says this persuasion okay they got persuaded they're thinking differently now than when Paul first taught them. He says, this persuasion, this thinking of yours does not come from him, Jesus, who calls you. He didn't, he didn't uh, persuade you to think and act like this. False teachers did. False teachers did. All right, closing story, closing story. Lee Horton and his brother Dennis know what it's like to walk free again after years behind bars. They were wrongly convicted of robbery and murder. And get this, they were sentenced to life in prison without parole. And they weren't guilty. This guy and his brother were put in prison and they weren't guilty of the crime. They were locked up in prison for 25 years. 25 years, and the, the governor of their state granted them clemency. He signed a document, and that man and his brother walked after 25 years. I want you to hear Lee Horton's story. Lee Horton said, I'm going to tell you honestly, I'm, and I'm, I'm quoting him here, I'm going to tell you honestly, the first thing that I was aware of when I walked out of the doors and sat in the car. The first thing I realized that I wasn't handcuffed. The entire time I've been in prison, any time I was transported anywhere, I always had handcuffs on. And that moment right there was the most emotional moment that I had. Even when they told me the governor had signed the papers, it didn't set in until I was in that car and didn't have those handcuffs on. I don't think people understand the punishment of being in prison. Everything 
is taken away from you. But when you get out, everything becomes beautiful to you. Everything. When we got out, we went to the DMV to get our driver's licenses back. My brother and I stood in line for two and a half hours. And you know, we heard all the bad things about the DMV and how long the wait is and everything. But we had the most beautiful time. And all the people were looking at us because we're smiling and we're laughing and they just couldn't understand why we were so happy. And it just was that. Just being in line was a beautiful thing. I was in awe of everything around me. It's like my mind was just heightened to every small nuance. Just to be able to just look out of a window, to walk down a street, to inhale fresh air, to just see people interacting, it woke something up in me. I've been having epiphanies every single day since I've been released. One of my morning rituals every morning is to send a message to my 42 contacts in my, in my phone. My morning message every day for all 42 people are, is, good morning, good morning, good morning, have a nice day. Now, they're all like, how long can he keep doing this? But they don't understand that I was deprived. They don't understand. And now, it's like I've been released and I've been reborn into a better day, into a new day. Like the person I was no longer exists. I've stepped through the looking glass onto the other side and everything is beautiful. Everything is beautiful. You've maybe been in a situation like this where you are up on a mountaintop or you may be at the bottom of a mountain looking up, beautiful lake, beautiful sky, beautiful mountain. It's overwhelming. It's because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He created everything. And even unbelievers, they are overwhelmed. They stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon for the first time. Wow. Oh my. God. Like I've said before, they start using God's name. Why? Because something in them, the, the image of God in them makes that come out of them because it's God. Only God could create something so beautiful. And folks, here's a guy that was in prison unjustly for 25 years. Look at how transformed he was when he got out because he began to realize how good he has it. How good it was to just breathe. How good it was to just look out. How good it was to see other people having fun and happy. They were in the DMV line and they're excited and they're happy and they're laughing. Nobody else was. And see, that's our problem. You know what? We are born again, New Testament believers, but we're living like people under the law. And so, you know what, everybody? Let's, let's do what I said last week. Let's trash that. Let's trash that. Let's trash that kind of thinking. Let's start opening our eyes, open them to the God's word and let him refresh you and remind you about how good you have it. Then look around you and think, man, you know, 98 billion people on earth would give their right arm to eat like I eat, to drive around like I drive around. You know, you remember old... Uh, Louis, Louis C.K., you remember the comedian? He talks about how people complain when they go on airplane flights across the country. He's saying, what are you doing complaining? You're on a magic carpet. You're flying five miles above the earth at, at 500 miles an hour. Listen, people used to go from New York to L.A., and it took them like five years, and half of them kicked the bucket before they made it there, and you get there in four hours. He said, what are you complaining about? You ought to be saying, I'm flying through the air. This is incredible. And you know what? That's how we need to get as God's people. Your kids need to see it. Your coworkers need to see it. They need to see a different you and me. And so let's do that, everybody. Let's trash the old way and let's take in the new. There's so much to lose. Don't lose it. Don't lose those wonderful things God wants you to have. All right, let's bow our heads for prayer, everyone. Father, thank you for your word today. Lord, 
Man, it just pierces our hearts, Lord, the power of a few sentences. And Lord, how we should be living and, and thinking and relating. So Father, I pray your grace to rest on your people. And Lord, little by little, let them, to, let them be transformed by your spirit. As they drink in your word, I pray that, Lord, it'll just do its mighty work. And, Lord, how often we pray for this. And, Lord, just ask that they'll just become just new people, Lord. Lord, I love every one of them, Lord. And, and Lord, uh, but we just want to go higher for you, Lord. I do, Lord. And I know they do. So, Lord, help us use your word and use, use us as brothers and sisters to, to motivate, to spur good works and encourage one another. Help us, Lord. We put it all in your good hands. Lord, let this week, let us bring you honor and glory, Lord. And we ask all these things in your mighty name, Lord Jesus. And all of God's people said... Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us on the stream. Thank all of you. I hope that you're encouraged today. Go out now and have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday, and we're going to have a great time. Men, don't forget, prayer breakfast this Saturday. All the men, 9 o'clock. You're going to love it. Thank you, everybody.